The plea is to base the policies on evidence. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. This is the last of our six-part education series. Today, we're looking at a public health approach to illegal drug use. I want to start by asking a fundamental question. How do we deal with illegal drugs in Canada? And the answer was best described in a piece of research that came out of the St. Paul's Center for Excellence folks, and they observed how we spend the money. Specifically, we spend 73% of our tax dollars on the enforcement approach when dealing with illegal drugs in our society. We spend 14% on treatment, 3% on prevention, and for those folks who are saying, why are you spending all that money on harm reduction? The answer is, we're not. We're spending about 3%, which is the tiniest piece of the pie. So most of the money goes where? It goes to cops, border guards, jailers, judges, the whole enforcement industry. We are talking billions of dollars. Specifically, Canadians in 2002 dollars spent $2.33 billion. If I was an American, I'd talk about the war on drugs. But no, I'm going to talk about what we're actually talking about. We're talking about the process of criminalizing drugs. We get awfully confused. And we blend in the media all the time three separate harms. We get confused of the harms from addiction, which get blended with the harms from drugs and the harms from drug prohibition itself. Let's talk first about the harms from addiction. What is addiction? Addiction is essentially out of control behavior. And when we go to the place of addiction, we tend to become socially disconnected. One of the repetitive themes through this presentation is addiction is an attachment disorder. When we go to the place of addiction, we can apply that experience to many different experiences, including drugs, sex, food, the internet, dangerous sports, and quite frankly, even shopping can be part of our addictive experience. And addiction is not simple. When we go to the place of addiction, it has something to do with a bio, psycho, social, spiritual, and environmental phenomenon. It's something to do with the body, the mind, our social context, our sense of meaning and purpose in life, and the environment around us are all part of the addictive experience. Any drug has the potential for harm or benefit depending on who's using it, what context, and what purpose. In the 1500s, Paracelsus, the father of modern medicine, said, all substances are poisons. There is none that is not a poison, and it's the right dose that differentiates poison from remedy. So let's look at the harms from drugs. Let's look at the pharmacology themselves and what, they, what the drugs can do. There's a toxicity effect, the extent to which the drug is harmful to the body. Some drugs are specifically harmful to fetuses, alcohol being the worst offender. We also get confused about the toxicity of heroin versus the toxicity of alcohol. More people die from alcohol long-term chronic exposure than from heroin, which is actually benign to the body if taken in pure dosages every single day. Another harm from drugs is overdose. If somebody dies from taking too much of a drug, then that's a problem as well. And certainly we do have an overdose death rate history in Vancouver that is completely unacceptable. I would also suggest that a large part of the overdose death rate has to do with context of use. People die from drugs often because of the context in which the drugs are taken. And Often it's combinations of drugs that create a death toll in our city in terms of overdose deaths. Also, aggression certainly is the outcome of some people's drug experience. The most common offender in terms of drugs, in terms of that behavior, is alcohol. Now let's look at the harms from drug prohibition. There are many harms with drug prohibition. There are health, ecological, criminal, policing, social, educational, economic, and political harms from drug prohibition. Let's go through those one at a time. What are the health problems with drug prohibition? People who purchase drugs do not know the dosage, the purity, and the contaminants. 
based on the fact that the folks that are involved with distributing these things have no regulatory controls on them at all. And money spent on drug prohibition is not money spent on, ta on health care. We have a limited pot of tax dollars. Given that we have X number of dollars in the pot, we have to be very, very vigilant how we're going to spend that money. And we need to spend it based on evidence, not based on fear. Policies based on fear-based sound bites don't work very well for us. We need to shift to have policies based on evidence. We didn't learn very much from our experience with alcohol prohibition. What we had widely available during alcohol prohibition was strong, concentrated toxic alcohol. Why was it strong and concentrated? Because smugglers want small packages. And we see things like this, police probe drug murders. And the proliferation of guns in this province has something to do with the process of prohibition because people need the tools of violence to protect the drugs and the tools of violence are guns. Deadly violence after gang bust. Ah, interesting. When I've done this presentation with a cop, what that person has observed is that when they bust people, what it does is it creates a business opportunity that people fight over. So the police intervention in the process tends to create worse problems in terms of violence. The best summary slide that I've ever seen is this one, and it just simply says, we have an out of control process here. The drug war affects policing. Specifically, the tactics police have to use are more intrusive when dealing with drugs than any other crime. Body cavity searches do not exist with any other crime other than drugs. And that starts to change the police relationship with the public. And we need to be awfully vigilant about that. And there is an absolute epidemic of police corruption. And it's everywhere in all police departments. To have guys running into rooms full of unmarked cash is a huge problem for the ethics and the integrity of police departments. Now, it's curious because I did this presentation to the entire management of the Vancouver Police Department. And I sweated a bit before I did that presentation. Because to talk about police corruption here and not talk about it there would be hugely unethical. So I plucked up my courage and I said to them what I'm saying to you, and then I looked around the room. And what I got was about 35 guys that looked at the floor and shuffled their feet. And what I talked about was the fact that in all police departments, it's a real problem for them. Because what happens is there's all this unmarked cash. And guys, supervisors, will have new employees who really want to participate and do well and please their supervisors. They'll walk into a room and they'll be handed a bunch of cash. The moment they put that cash in the pocket, they become part of a process they cannot back out of. And it's hugely difficult for them. And Gil Pewter, who was a Vancouver cop, had a terminal illness. He had cancer. And he realized he was going to die. So he had nothing left to lose, quite frankly. So he started to speak the truth. And he got up on the podium and he talked about the stain on our badge of honor. That was the name of his talk. And he talked about drug prohibition being the stain on our badge of honor. And he talked about how incredibly destructive it was to have this process that was damaging to their credibility. Because we need cops. Cops are important. And they need to be honored and respected. And they need to play a very important role in our society as leaders. And if there's a problem going on with this process, it hurts them and therefore it hurts us. We've certainly asked the question in our city, and we've asked it repetitively, of who polices the police. And we have some trouble with that because the police police the police. So that doesn't work very well. So police investigating complaints against themselves is a problem, and we've acknowledged that. 